T-shirt time. T-shirt time. T-shirt time. Yeah. Woo. All right. We wow, got ourselves loud. 13 reviews this week. Lucky number 13. Yeah. And we got four shirts going out to the winners. We just keep throwing money away, don't we? <sighs> we do. Burn we do. it all. But it's well thrown away. All right. Our first winner is Madison9143. Not just a mom of twins. Ooh. Super a lot glamp. More than that. Super what? Super glamp. Oh, okay. Crime of the century. Mm. Uh, Snake Eyes 102. Mm. All of you are winners. Excellent. How do they get their shirts, Doug? Send the name I just read to iTunes at mindpumpmedia.com. Send your shirt size, your shipping address, and we'll get that right out to you. Thanks, everybody. If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this episode of Mind Pump, Adam gets super controversial Ooh. again. <laughs> uh, the bet is, can Adam piss everybody off? Yeah, we're, we're waiting to see. We'll see what happens. He's getting close. He's determined. Uh, we talk about my new garage gym and why I like working out in uh, garages and why uh, the other guys like working out in gyms, uh, what the benefits are of each of them. We talk about working out with Ben Pikulski, one of the uh, coolest, smartest bodybuilders I've ever met. Also a massive, massive human being. His legs are about, one leg is about the size of two dugs. Yeah. We actually They're like measure. with the redwood trees yeah. in my backyard. We talk about the differences in lifting techniques and training routines. And that's all in the 37-minute intro. Then we get into the questions. Question one, how do I improve my squat? Boy, is that a loaded question. Oh, yeah. We attack it. Next question was, what is your opinion on carb cycling for fat loss? Um, do we like it? Is it valid? Or do we think it's stupid? Sure. We talk about that in this episode. Then we talk about the biggest criticisms we've got with our MAPS programs. Uh, or did we get any criticisms? Uh, here's a hint. I doubt it. Nobody says anything negative. I, I doubt it. Lastly, we answer a question. Uh, we answer the question about what we thought of the Netflix documentary, What the Health. This thing is super popular right now. Everybody's watching it. And we've all gotten probably 25 messages each. Yeah. On our opinion on this epi- on this particular what documentary, the shit. we decided to watch it, and you may be surprised at what we think about it, or you actually may not be surprised. Or Listen if you're a listener for a long time, you would know exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Listen to this episode for all that amazing information. Also, there's only three days left for our summer starter pack. This starter pack includes Maps Anabolic, which is our foundational program, nutrition and fasting guide our MAPS Prime program and access to our forum. We take all that stuff, we bundled it together very mm. nicely in a wonderful tight package. With a ribbon. And then we cut it more in half uh, in terms of the price. Holy Huge discount. Shit, that's aggressive. Go to mindpumpmedia.com to enroll in that now. You know what? There's a missed opportunity there. Uh, you're talking about working out in your garage, and I didn't give you the Weezer song that would apply best for Oh, that. what is yeah. it? In the garage. I feel safe. No one cares about my ways. Enjoy the episode, everybody. Dang. Oh, my goodness. Did I get some heat for the girl uh, question the other day? Sometimes I hear what you're saying. Oh, Adam. And I I just quietly allow you <laughs> to say it because you're allowed to have theories of course well you know, it, it's, you know it was like i told i told somebody i knew who, you'd get heat i, I know of you, course i knew you'd get heat and you know what for as much heat as i got i got the same the other said like oh i'm glad someone said something you know so it's like you can't make everybody happy and at the end of the day it's my opinion and i said listen here's my opinion like i've had you know 10 years of running big box gyms and this has happened to me not a couple times not 10 times but a lot and mm-hmm. You know, the greater percentage were more more situations where somebody was, you know, drawing attention to themselves. They were the common denominator in it. Now, that being said, that doesn't mean I'm not fucking saying that there's not a ton of people at the, the other mm-hmm. side of the coin where they're getting harassed by some fucking asshole so, because I've had to launch that guy out of the gym, too. So, so. To, to your defense, and this is in regards because some people might not have heard that conversation. This is in regards to. A question we had on a, a few episodes ago in a, in a qua where a young lady was asking, she was talking about how guys are kind of following around in the gym and being creepy and, you know, douchebags or whatever, and like how she can prevent it because she doesn't think she's doing anything to, to draw attention or whatever. And Adam, t- and we, Adam basically said was some people do draw attention to themselves and then get upset when they do get that attention. And I, uh, of, of course, you're going to get heat for it because in today's 
uh, climate, and it's it's political climate. Climate that's what's driving this is that uh, people will will assume that you're placing blame or excusing shitty behavior. In other words, right? Which I'm totally in other words, if there's a uh, a woman uh, or a man, you know, working out in a gym and exposing a lot of their body. And then they get lots of attention on themselves and maybe it's negative attention. Maybe there's a guy that's like, you know, makes a a disparaging remark, you know, like, hey, you're hot or, you know, something really bad, right? It's not excusing that guy for saying that, but there's definitely a higher likelihood that you may get attention that you may not like, you know, it's just, it's, it's almost, you know what it reminds me of? It's almost like, and this, I'm going to draw a parallel here that might even piss people off. But it's like saying, hey, um, you know, I'm going to carry a firearm on me. I'm going to get a concealed carry permit because I want to make sure I can protect myself in case something happens. And then people will say, well, you shouldn't have to do that. People shouldn't just should just know not to come after you. It's like, look, that's just the, the reality is if you are in a certain situation, if you place yourself in a, in a, in a situation or – if you dress a certain way or if you say certain things, because your words can do this as well, the likelihood that you may garner attention uh, from people you may not want it from or that you may hear things that are, or you may increase the likelihood of some shit happening, it's just higher and that's just fucking reality. I hate to say it, but it's true. It's just the reality. Uh, it's so it's not excusing that shitty behavior because I don't care if you're a woman and you're walking around in the streets naked. If you're walking around in the streets naked and doesn't give any pervert the right to say to or touch do you or doing yeah, it, of course, course not. not. No. But is the likelihood that you're going to get that attention yeah. higher? Well, it's, it's fucking that's reality. Well, I don't it, understand why people get mad at that. And I and I it's think just the way well, it I think is. it's and it's because a little bit of on the side that she was the one asking the question. I think you right. know, and so it's like if you're going to assess that this is a question coming from her, like why is this all happening? Why do I keep getting this type of attention? You know, like it's just it's just a logical conclusion to not just look at, um, you know, what your environment is, but also look within what you're projecting. Well, right. it's not the first time I've been asked that question. I've been asked that question many times and I don't remember the, the actual girl that asked the question. So I, don't, I can't speak on her profile. Uh, but typically this this person who asks a question like this and I'll go through like their Instagram and I'll look at like their photos are posting and it's like. Okay, well, you're taking, you know, your shots in the your selfie mirror, half naked, bending over, showing your clam, like, and then you wonder why you get well, like that's a term I haven't heard. In a you while. wonder why you get all these perverts writing shit, and not to justify what they're doing. I'm not saying that they're fucking not in a wrong or they're not inappropriate. Like, yeah, fuck those guys too. But you have to ask yourself at some point, am I am I drawing attention to myself? What would way? your big brother tell you? Right. Yeah. And, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> if you had a big brother, what would he tell you? And sometimes, sometimes you're doing nothing, right? Sometimes, and this is also true, sometimes you're doing nothing at all to attract any kind of, you know, you're, you're just, you're normal, you're dressed normal, you're minding your own business. And this is a lot of times that there's just shitty people out there that are going to fuck with you. Now, in either situation, whether you're dressed provocatively and you're saying certain things or you're wearing a T-shirt that says something, you know, that's provocative uh, or, you know, that's going to cause some kind of controversy or you're not, both cases, it does not excuse someone acting like an asshole. It's never okay to act like an asshole, be a creep or whatever. There's never an excuse for that. Just the likelihood of that happening goes up when you're sending potential different signals and you may be sending signals that you're you're not aware you're sending or that you're not even trying to send so remember this human whether you like it or not this is just again it's just fucking reality okay and it's people aren't perfect just the way it is that we read each other both consciously and unconsciously based on signals that we get from that person and it's everything from body language to whether they're smiling to the clothes they wear their hairstyle You're going to see someone, even for a split second, you're going to pick up on signals and your brain starts to make decisions on that person. It's been proven over and over again. And it's, it, it does it. Everybody does it. Everybody does it. Your brain evolved to do it. You could try and be as conscious as you want to say that that doesn't happen. It just does. And it's just reality. And it it can be anything. It can be your skin color. It can be your sex. It can be anything. So knowing that if you're in a situation where you're like, okay, I'm in a gym 
and or I'm at a bar and I really don't want the attention from, you know, people. I don't want creeps coming on to me or whatever. So I'm going to try and put out signals that say, don't approach me. I'm unapproachable. That will lower the likelihood. There still may be some creeps, but that will just lower the likelihood. Like, here's another example that I know everybody's not going to have a problem with. Like, if I went to a super ultra progressive liberal political rally. I can't believe you're going this direction because I was just going to say I would give Sal the same advice if I caught you wearing your capitalism shirt at a liberal rally. Right. And you got your and you got jumped. Yeah. And you got jumped. So those assholes no you're just wearing no a right. t-shirt. You're yeah. not saying anything, but because you're wearing a capitalism shirt at a liberal ra- rally, you could get some shit like or, that. Or more accurate would be like at a socialism type rally, right? right. Uh, or if I'm wearing a, and I'm, I'm not a Trump supporter, I want to make sure I say that before everybody freaks out. But if I went to like a super progressive liberal rally and I'm wearing like America, you know, make America great hat. And a, right. there's been videos of people. Now I've seen this, like dudes will go to a, a rally. Which wearing you have the, the opposing, right to. You have every right. And to nobody do has that a right to fuck with you. Right. They, nobody can touch you. Nobody can steal your hat from you. Nobody can be violent towards you. I don't even if you use words, I could yell racist slurs and be the biggest asshole in the world, but doesn't give the right to for someone to hit me. But if I go yell racist slurs and I'm around the people that I'm make, you know uh, throwing these remarks at or about, the likelihood that someone's going to hit me is much higher. Right. <laughs> so it's just it's just reality. Um, but in no way, shape, or form, and people can listen to the episode 100. percent no way, shape, or form are you making an excuse for people acting like assholes. Fuck so no. For people to get upset with what you're saying, it's this hypersensitive political climate that we live in where we are throwing away, we're completely throwing away logic because we're trying to be so politically correct that it's... it's it, it, The bullies have changed uniforms. It's Dude, I read, and this is, <laughs> again, this is rare. Great metaphor. This is rare, but this actually happened. I should I should look it up so I know accurately what the where this happened. But I read a story a while ago where this this young lady accused this guy of uh, raping her, and then they went to court, and the court subpoenaed their text messages and subpoenaed all these different things, and the evidence there was zero evidence that he did that, and all the evidence was that she she made it up and lied because she didn't want people to know that or par- her parents to know that she had sex with this guy. So she, her parents, you know, uh, confronted her and her parents were super strict. And she's like, no, 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 he forced me. And that was the way she excused it. She admitted it that he never, that she later on said he didn't, I, I apologize, but it doesn't matter. Guy got kicked out of school. Guy got like lost his job. Like all these horrible things happen because in the, in the political climate, that's such a sensitive subject that, even if you suggest, or if the guy suggests that she's lying, for example, that he's got almost no case. This has been this has happened with uh, custody battles with fathers and mothers. I know I just went through a divorce, and luckily both me and my ex were ap- amicable and worked together. But more often than not, the father will get fucked if they go and go to court and they try to fight over custody and all that kind of stuff. Or the guy, the more often than not, the court will side with the at mother, least in California, in most states. Um, and this is just statistically true. And of course, there's definitely, you know, cases where women get the short end of the stick because of their sex. And of course, there's racism and all this. Different. It's just reality. And sometimes we have to kind of accept it and not be so afraid of saying certain things because we're trying to be politically correct. At the end of the day, there is no excuse for physical violence. There's no excuse for uh, threats. There's no excuse for theft or damaging someone's property no matter what, uh, bottom line. But sometimes you, you put yourself in situations where you may increase the likelihood of it. I, bottom line is, I don't care what topic we're talking about. If it's a common reoccurring theme in your life, at one point you have to ask yourself something. Like to, At one point. I don't care what we're talking about. It doesn't have to be this whole topic about women or politics or any of that stuff. Like If something is continually happening in my life that I don't like, at one point, I have to self-reflect and ask, "What am I? What part do I play in this role?" That's all I'm fucking saying. That's all the advice was. It wasn't trying to s- segregate anybody or say that, "Oh, the, all these girls are asking for." No, fuck that. Of course, there's always exceptions to the rule. Of course, there's going to be some fucking creep and weirdo that needs to get his ass kicked no matter what. I'm not saying that. All I'm saying is that listen, 
if something continues to happen to you over and over and over, at some point, we should self-reflect. Everybody should, no matter what the fucking thing we're talking about is. That's just my opinion. That's and, very- that's, and that's it. It's my opinion. Like, if you disagree with me and you don't believe in self-reflection and you don't believe asking yourself, what is the common denominator in this situation? What can I do differently? Then to, to each their own. Go around all day long blaming others on everything, but that's just not my style. And if you're going to ask me a question, that's what I'm going to tell you. Now, there was a, I had a buddy who drove... You know the old school Hummers, the one that like Schwarzenegger used to drive? Yeah. Like the big fucking tank. Big old shoebox And tank. he had, uh, the what are they called? The big pipes that come out, smokestacks or whatever, uh-huh. where he, I don't know what he would do. It's all but, dieseled out. Yeah, and he'd hit the gas or whatever, and freaking black smoke would come out, right? <laughs> and he had big like uh, Confederate, like a Confederate uh, sticker on the back of his thing. And he was a cool guy. He was just very abrasive, and yeah. uh, but he yeah. was nice little, to me. A little so. inflammatory, yeah. Dude would drove to San Francisco, parked his car on the side of the road, came back, and his fucking spray painted and tire slashed, and he was like, you know, and I'm, of course nobody, I mean, nobody has an excuse to damage his property. Yeah, but he was like shocked, like like what? I yeah. can't believe that happened. Those motherfuckers! Oh, like, you can't believe that happened. How dare they? <laughs> you know, and I'm like, well, first of all, nobody should do that. They are assholes. But dude, you fucking drove. Like a, a, you got a flag. Yeah, you might yeah, as well yeah. have like dead, you know, baby seals hanging off the back, and like you know, uh, oil <laughs> slicks coming out the back, and yeah. a, like, you know, kill pe- all hippies. You, you know? drove like in on the, your bumper sticker. You drove to yeah. in your enemy's territory. Of yeah, course, come on, fuck dude. With your shit, yeah. so. Some people just need some common sense. Yeah. Anyway, it's lost. Anyway, changing <laughs> yeah. the subject. Yeah. I had a fucking excellent workout this morning, dude. Did you? It felt. God, does it feel good to be back right now? Right? It consistency, man, is getting back to it, dude. It, getting getting in the routine of of. Working out well, again, so I, I, I put a gym in my garage. Yeah. And it's super basic. I have a cage. I have like an like a basic cable and kettlebells and dumbbells and adjustable bench. And fuck, man. I know, I know, Adam, you said you love working out in gyms. I fucking love working out in garages. Nothing like makes i just love working out well it's funny because you made that statement that like how pumped you are and like you can see the energy and the the twinkle in your eye about having this like (laughs) at home gym like it's on bro yeah yeah. watch how much i'm gonna get ripped right now home because you have an at home gym and it's funny because we we have this beautiful facility that we have here and i'm training less in here now and i'm back into my you know old routine of being in gold a good four or five days out of the week and you know what which is weird and because I'm listening to what you're saying and, and the reason why you enjoy the the privacy of turning the lights off in your own gym. And I can totally appreciate it because working out for me very much so is my, you know, my meditation. Like I feel I'm uh, totally in a zone. I really don't pay attention to others around me. I'm like listening to my music. My hat bill is down over my eyes and I'm totally tuned into what I'm doing. But th- I don't know. There's just something about the energy of all these other people working towards goals and all these different machines and dumbbells and kettlebells and tools like and just everyone working towards a goal it just gets me going mm-hmm. and i tend to have phenomenal workouts in that environment i think most people are probably like you do, do uh do you have a preference, Justin? Whether I work at a gym or at my house? Yeah. Yeah, I I I like actually working out in a gym setting just because I can disassociate myself with uh, my house. My house is like, uh, I mean, it has different, uh, when I'm at home, I'm trying to like be more peaceful, you know, and mm-hmm. like I'm trying to like pay attention to, you know, uh, the needs and the family and what I need to do at the house. Like, I think uh, it's hard because then you start like wrapping in the kids kind of like it's I look at that as like a more fun you, you know, mm-hmm. workouts versus like when I want to get serious, like I have to go to like a gym or I have to go in another environment. So we actually have like that one uh, family gym that's been really helpful for that because then the kids, you know, have a structured sort of play. Like they have all that this stuff for them there in the daycare center. And then we, you know, my wife kind of does her thing. We start out kind of doing the same thing. There's two different squat racks. So we, we, we usually start on the squat rack together and then she does her weight. I do mine. And then we split off and kind of do our own workout. So that's been working out really well. See, I think, I think for me, the reason why, cause I'm sure I was thinking about this and it's just like, it gives me a, like a totally different energy. Like when I'm in a garage gym and it's basic and it's just me and maybe my training partner and I, I work out almost every workout with uh, my girlfriend um, it just gives me this different feel, this fire, mm. this like focus. And I just, I just get this great feeling from it. And I think it's because the first, when I first fell in love with weights, it was in my parents' backyard. 
Uh, yeah. So my association with that feeling that makes sense was with that. And so the first God, I mean, let's see, if I started lifting weights at around 13 years old, probably the first two or three years was uh, entirely in backyards or garages. It was either my backyard yeah. where I worked out in my backyard and and I got real creative with free weights or it was in my cousin's uh, uh, backyard where I'd go when we'd go visit him up in Sacramento and then me and him would have these fucking epic workouts in the, in their backyard. So there was that for the first couple couple years when I fell in love with it. Then I worked in gyms and I always worked out in gyms and you know that was fun too. But then for 12 years I owned my own personal training studio and in the middle of the day we didn't have clients coming in so I'd shut the lights off, get dark in there, and then I'd do my own workout. So it was like my own gym. Yeah, you reminded me of, uh, I mean, we bought plates and, and we had a bench and everything outside. I remember when I was in this this house with these guys in college and that was awesome, dude. We just were hitting it like every day. It, and it was like so motivating with that. I think if I did have like plates and a bench and I had like a place to deadlift and all that, that would be totally different. I just like, you know, all I have is like kettlebells at my house. It's, so. just, it's just so motivating to me. It's so fun. I love that I can take my time or go faster or fucking yell or do whatever I want. I love that I can work out my shirt off. Um, just something about the feel of doing that. I can work out barefoot. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just, uh, it's my favorite thing. And the other thing I love about it is I've, because I've worked out for so long with minimal equipment, because even in my personal training studio, I had a cable machine and that was it. Everything else was uh, free weights. And uh, of course, when I was in my backyard, it was even more basic. And my garage is basic and I'm not going to make it very complicated. It's, uh, I get so creative with free weights. Like there's a lot of different movements that people don't even know anymore because of machines that you do with free weights and it's just fun. It's fun to like change angles and try different things. And I even like this is, and I, I know it's association because I even like adjustable dumbbells as shitty as they are. I love the feel. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, no. I know, I right? I hate adjustable. It looks like a fish bone by the time you get like all of it off. Isn't know? that funny? Yeah. So yeah. I, I, it has to be an association thing, but yeah. I would love well, to. Well, you know what? I, there's something, too, to be said. Like I was thinking, as you're sitting here talking, I'm going like, That's you know funny. what? I kind of want it all because for me, it, it really depends on the mood. Like even right now, we canceled the, the Club One membership not that long ago, right? Or Club Sport, yeah. whatever it's yeah. called now. And I was just telling Katrina yesterday that I want to go get it started again. And she's like, really? You, you have like five other memberships. Yeah, she's, exactly. Yeah. She's like, you have like five memberships yeah. and you have your own gym. They and all you, have different meaning. Well, exactly. Yeah. And, and and each one have have their place, right? So I feel like, you know, what I was missing from Club Sport that we don't have is it's this very spa-like place. Yeah, where, the steam room. Yeah, the steam and sauna. Like, I, you, I mean, you feel very comfortable walking. This place is so clean and nice that you feel comfortable walking barefoot and naked around everywhere in the bathroom. Like I literally do. Like yeah. I would just walk around in there <laughs> naked, barefoot, just feel comfortable yeah. inside there. See, just slapping old guys asses. Right. <laughs> it's just, it's a, it's a really, really nice facility. It has all the, the uh, really plush amenities that I would, but that being said, I feel very weird slamming 500 pounds on the ground inside there. The whole gym turns oh, yeah. around and looks at you. So they give you like a stink eye. Right. Yeah. So, so then I do like, I like having a private facility or another facility for things like that. So, and then there's times where I do, I want to come in here and I want to do what I love to do in our facility is when I'm doing a lot of mobility type stuff, I can get on the grass and take my time and stretch and crank up the music how I mm-hmm. want to, or even possibly dim the lights like Sal was saying and kind of go through my, and, you know, leave. it's interesting that the environment, like in here, even you notice that like it, it's a more of an athletic, uh, uh oh, yeah. mobility movement like type of environment we've created. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I totally get that. Cause like if I go into golds or I go into one of these other type of uh, gyms, like you get that, like, Oh, or even when we were with Ben, Ben pack, like, you know, just his gym, just, it was so like, I wanted to, to oh, lift like that. Can we talk about that? Yeah. Look, yeah. That oh, was a great gym. I, and I got me back in the, in the, the bro. He was, it action. was a very yeah. bodybuilder. Feel, he was yeah. teasing me. Cause I said it was top three and I didn't say it was the best gym I'd ever been in. Yeah. And I, I've been trying, I've been, I know there's gotta be a gym. That I fell in love with more than that one, but I don't know. I'm having a hard time. I might have to give him credit as the best gym I've ever been in, which says a fucking lot since I've probably been in hundreds of them. Mm. And uh, it, right up my alley because I felt like it had the things that I I would want for the for the functional side. Like it had the grass in there so I could do mm-hmm. sled and sled drag. But it wasn't there. like the primary focus. It was like no. there is is function. Like it's just right here. Yeah. Here's, here's yeah this right. part of it. So and to me, but and then it had. 
every fucking machine and toy a bodybuilder could possibly want. I mean, yeah. it was. Oh, yeah. You could isolate a muscle oh, from 50 million different angles oh, in that gym. Yeah. It was every, really cool. every little yeah. muscle you could. There was a, there was like a machine yeah. for every small I muscle. I isolated my sphincter muscle. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah that, that's I'll good. isolate it. Yeah. So I definitely really, really like that gym there, there's, there's definitely a psychological connection, though, with weights. Because now we're talking. I'm trying to think, like, what are some of my favorite gyms I've ever been in? And you know which one? If I if I think about that, there's one that st- stands out to me, and I never even worked out in it. We just went in there. It was the gym that we filmed all the exercises for Maps Aesthetic. Oh, oh yeah, because yeah. there's that nostalgia feel, I, that's the it. old weights. That's and stuff. it. Yeah. It's because I all- believe she should. They shut that gym down that's too. too bad. Bad. Do you know that was yeah. the? So you never worked out in that. I grew up working out in that gym. Yeah, mm-hmm. that was my my first real experience. Now I worked out with my buddy in the garages, and we kind of messed around at the high school gym a little bit. But mm-hmm. my first real membership was Inner Sport City. That's what it was called. Inner Inner Sport. Uh, city in Modesto, California, and that gym, uh, man, just well, old, I feel the old. same about little tiny gyms like that with like beat up like iron weights and all that because like oh. that's all I experienced. Well, Brendan, Sh- every Shapati like, was one of I your favorites, with. right? Yeah. I think Shapati mm-hmm. was probably one of your yeah. favorite gyms. I loved know. it, but yeah, when we walked in the that one place you're talking about, Modesto, I never even worked out in there, but I saw all this old equipment that I hadn't seen in a long time. That just connected me to my youth when I worked out at the YMCA or when I worked out at 24 Fitness before they remodeled it on Hillsdale. Yeah. They had a lot of that old equipment or on Parkmore. The 24 Hour Fitness on Parkmore used to have all this old kind of like and they replaced it all with the newer shit. You know what I you know what I really liked about Ben Pack's gym that is different than like uh because it was it definitely flooded with lots of machines and stuff, right? Mm-hmm. But I feel like some gyms like Twenty Four Hour Fitness, they just they just put in like the newest, most trendy machine in there, whatever's new and, yeah. and trendy. Where I feel like Ben, being as uh, obviously as, uh, the level he is at, actually every machine in there was very methodic. Was it was methodical? You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like he, it wasn't just like, oh, this is the new cool, you know, Nautilus machine, no. so I have it. It's like. Each one of those pieces of equipment in there, like, had a purpose and were fucking awesome. Yeah, like, very specific angle to, to achieve this. Yes, you know? yes. Yeah. So that I just truly appreciated that because I've been in gyms before. Like, remember the one of my favorite gyms was the gym in Reno that we go to. Oh yeah, well I that one that's that just one. a monster. I mean, what, awesome. what is that like one hundred and fifty thousand? That's like a number feet. two gym for me for sure. Right. I mean, because that had like everything. Right. I mean, it had the the powerlifting side to the it. ramp with grass to push a sled up. Right. Dude, fuck. Right. So, What's the what what is there a machine you can think of that you don't see too much anymore that you grew up using that you really like, if you see it, you're like, Oh, yeah. I got to use that machine. Uh, pull over. I, oh, fuck. Man, I mean, right. it's so similar. I love, I love the pullover machine, the old Nautilus one. They don't make them like that anymore. God, you know what I'm talking about? Yes. The yes. old, the old, and you know what, you know, I'll tell you one right now that I know you're going to fucking agree with me on for sure. I guarantee it. It's a standing side lateral machine so it's a machine with metal handle metal bar oh, metal yeah. handles yeah, yeah. and you do side laterals on it and i <laughs> fucking loved it when i was a kid and if i ever i never see it anywhere no one ever has it but if i ever find it it's funny that some of these great machines they they moved on from them is that like up verticals what do you mean no yeah. Side, oh, I see. You're making laterals. fun of my side. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> that went over your head. It did. Yeah, fuck. It did. But yeah, I loved. I loved uh, the pullover machine, and I loved the the lateral machine. Those were two that I just I never see. Anywhere. That's the first one that comes to mind because whenever I do see it, I get so excited because I feel like only a handful of gyms still have the, a good pullover machine. Uh, what else though? There's other ones that when I see, I go like, oh man, so glad to see that. Some don't have and the golds that I go to has this, so it's I, it's one of my favorite machines and why I love there are two. So donkey calf raises. Oh yeah, that one's <laughs> those totally are hard. Awesome. Donkey calf raises yeah. are hard to to find. I love these exercises. Yeah, shit that you don't. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, not all of us were blessed with. Fucking I'm, I'm not. Fat, I'm just the, fat fucking I calves. Bro. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I wish I had <laughs> fat calves, dude. Then I would. <laughs> <laughs> I would give a shit about all those exercises. Just I know over. they're right. just such funny exercises. Yeah. <laughs> They're only funny because you don't have to build them, you fuck ass wipe. Like if you, <laughs> you say, it's like, I'm if just you, donkey, donkey, donkey. You know. If you actually, yeah. I mean, I don't even know if you have you ever done calves before. Do you even have you? Do you know how to do I, calves? I, like one time, yeah, yeah that one say, where you sit down, and you put the thing. God, over I hate people. See, the calf, you don't even know the name of it. Whatever. Shut yeah. up. <laughs> you know, hey, you know what? Yeah, I don't do that shit. You know what's funny though is going to Ben Pack's gym and yeah, using all these machines. Yeah. Here it comes and. <laughs> 
Justin is like I'm like a fish out of water. He's like, what is all this machine? I'm like, what shit? the fuck is this? You guys are trying to. I couldn't even get like the right hand position. Yeah, you don't know, know what to sit. I'm or like, what to do. You're like, you know, you got to squeeze them. It's like, I, I, you know, though, I have to give because you, you're such a movement guy. I have yeah. to give yeah. you kudos though fuck. on uh, on keeping your cool and allowing Ben to critique you. Yeah, I mean, I I know that, and talk about. Uh, you know this, and this happens a lot, uh, with, especially with trainers. Trainers, we, we all have egos. It just comes mm. with the territory. Mm -hmm. And when trainers try and tell other trainers what to do, it is the funniest thing ever to watch because it's like nails on the chalkboard. It is like nails on the chalkboard, and it's like any, if you have some self awareness that if you are an educated fitness professional and you're talking to another educated fitness professional. That the there you want them to ask you for help if you're gonna give yeah. gonna give any whatsoever. I've all the years yeah, that we've all real we have all worked together. We are we couldn't all be more different. We all have our own style. We have our own opinion on things. And I still would never come over and tell one of you how to do an exercise. Mm. Yeah, because I perform it differently. Unless you ask me. If now yeah. if you said, how's hey, my technique yeah, for this? Or which yeah, I've I'll, definitely I'll done. I think in. with you guys before. If yep. I'm doing a compound movement, I said, hey. Tell me, I, what do I look like? You know, critique me and my rip, hips coming up too fast with that. And then I'm asking for it. And we I all do that with each other. Yeah. Right. Especially if it's a new movement or something like that, you know. I'm but, totally that. <laughs> but watching Ben uh, critique Justin on his mechanics <laughs> well, I mean, on the machine, I thought it was hilarious. Well, it's totally, it's totally like you, uh, Justin is a movement performance. Yeah. Like he trains movements, period. End of story. If yeah. it's moving a weight, he's figuring out how to do it in the most efficient way with the best form to minimize injury and to generate force. Right. And if he's if you know if you're doing a press and you're pressing above your head, what you're thinking is how can I press this weight being stable, being strong, generating force? You're not thinking how can I feel this the yeah, most. I'm not thinking how to my, squeeze my delt and right. you know, and then get this to respond and which like we're, we'll probably do a whole episode at some point on the difference between the two because it's it there's validity there's to, to both. both. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's just sure. different. It's yeah. just different. It's just like have you ever taken a body? Well, and I, have you ever taken a bodybuilder and had them do just a, like push a sled or some kind of a functional movement and watch them isolate muscles? I've yeah. seen bodybuilders do a deadlift and they're like they're hitting their lats. They're trying to squeeze their lats with the deadlift. And then it's like, no, like, it's a what? deadlift. Just fucking lift it. It's not yeah. an isolation movement. Well, well, you know, and I think it's, uh, there's no wrong or right, you know. And there's, I've been plenty of times where I've been lifting with Justin for years and we've lifted side by side and I've never once critiqued that and I've been well aware of that. I mean, mm -hmm. we when we, if you watch him bench press and you watch me bench press, it looks oh, like two different exercises. Different, yeah. yeah, it looks like two different ex exercises and it's not my way's right, his way's wrong. It's like that's how he trains, and it's for him. He's he's looking for something out of that movement more than a certain way, and I'm looking for something mm -hmm. out of it, which I think is a good topic is actually that there is, uh, I think – we we get we always want to get in these camps of what's right or wrong and you know there's everything has its place you know I think the the important thing is and where I try and come at people is to understand what why you're doing that like mm -hmm. if you're gonna do something a certain way just understand your your desired outcome there like because a lot of times people's uh, process that they choose doesn't match their true desired outcome it's like oh my goal is to build this or do that but then I'm I'm training a certain way it's like well. You could do that, and I'm not saying there's something wrong with that process. It's just that if that's your desired outcome, that may not be the best approach for that. So mm -hmm. there's definitely uh, validity to both, right? You'll, you'll find the most effective people in, uh, in a given modality or whatever tend to be also the most open-minded and will take uh, you know, what – works from different methods and apply and they'll apply it to themselves. Mm -hmm. And you're doing yourself a huge disservice by being so close-minded that you don't even consider that there may be uh you know there there may be a a, a, a validity to something that's so different from what you're doing. You know the uh the Gracie family, okay? We know about the Gracies cuz they're jujitsu guys. I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. The Gracie family, uh, who kind of pioneered Brazilian jiu-jitsu or changed uh, the judo that they learned from uh, the Japanese instructors and kind of modified it for their own, you know, for their own use, what has has been has changed a lot since the you know since Helio Gracie was doing jiu-jitsu. One of the first family members to really reach out and learn different things, who's also regarded as one of the best 
grapplers of that time. If you ask any of the Gracies, you ask Hickson or Hoyce or you know uh, or or you know Helio before he passed away, who one of the best, who the best jujitsu guy was, and they'll talk about uh, uh, Holes Gracie, R O L L S Gracie. A lot of people don't know who he is. He died at a rather young age, but when he was training, he was like the best uh, Gracie besides Hickson. And the reason why he was so good was he was a Brazilian jiu-jitsu guy that trained, would go to train Sambo with the, with the Russian uh, fighters. Then he would go train judo with the judo fighters. Then he'd go do some American wrestling. Then he would go do like all these different, you know, he'd try catch wrestling, which is an American style of wrestling. And he'd go and he'd learn all these different techniques and then he'd bring it back and he'd like dominate his opponents. And it wasn't because he went, he, he wasn't the guy that said, oh, Russian Sambo, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is better than that. And, you know, he may be right, he may be wrong, but let's say they go one-on-one, Jiu-Jitsu guy, Sambo guy, the Jiu-Jitsu guy might win, but that doesn't mean that there isn't something he can learn from it. And in training, it's the same way. So if you're a movement guy and you're just focused on power, you may there may be some benefit from Focusing on, you know, isolating a muscle not, here and not there, may, and vice versa. Not may, hundred percent there is. Well, I, I just talked about this the other day that uh, somebody actually did a. I'm great, just trying to open people's minds. I know, you know I know, but I this I'm passionate about this because this is something that you will always find me doing is moving in and out. Like, I I think that there's huge benefits to moving in and out of different modalities and ways of training. I think for the for a majority of people have uh, get caught in training a certain way because let's be honest we like it and there's nothing wrong with that either though right like so and I try to explain this to people too that listen if you love the way you train like you have like a rep range and sets or a workout that you love and and it's like therapeutic for you and you're in the shape you want to be in and like Dude, by all means, fucking train that way every day of your life if you like. And it, who cares if there's more benefits of doing other things? You enjoy that. And if you enjoy that, then go for it. But if you are looking for change, you know, and you want your body to change, which I think a lot of people are and searching for, if that is what you're in search of, then one of the best things you could possibly do is to weave in and out of different modalities, mm-hmm. programs, and ways of training. I just think that if uh, with fitness, you've got like the bodybuilders, the crossfitters, the power lifters, the Olympic lifters, the marathon. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and everybody, you know, mar- you know, marathon runners, right? That's yeah. not even in the state. Uh, that's a totally different category. Yeah. Pre- it's all people moving. You know what I'm saying? And I think if we're more inclusive and more like, you know, if I'm a bodybuilder, and I run into a, a distance runner rather than kind of talking shit or whatever. Like, oh, you're this is awesome. Let's talk about how we like to move. And is there some benefit that I may learn from how you train? Yeah. There may be. There, and I say there may be because I don't want to be so like, you know, I don't want to tell people like for sure because then that might turn people up. Just be open minded to it. You'd be you would be surprised at how many different things you can yeah, learn. You know, I've like so you much. have to completely do a one eighty. It's 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 just kind of introducing those those techniques and those concepts and, and applying them into your program to to benefit what you're currently doing. Because obviously the the principle of specificity applies to like very specific pursuits, but at the same time, like you can benefit those pursuits by introducing other modalities to experience for a while to, you know, break the monotony of it. But then you go right back to the skills and in, in the training that's specific to what you're trying to achieve. It, it's going to benefit it. It just depends on the right dosage. You know, this reminds me of that. This is the final three days to get the best program in the fucking world. Hmm. Final three days left to get our starter kit. Oh right, yeah. yeah. With the with Maps Anabolic and what do we put in there? Prime. We put the nutrition survival guide and, and access then, to the forum. And then access to the forum. Yeah, that's definitely our best. Uh, I'd say way to get started. Maps Anabolic is extremely effective just for overall strength uh, and, and muscle. A lot of the the building of that program, you know, it's like somebody was asking the other day about you know like oh well you know is you know, is this the best way to do it? Well, what we did was we took our experience and what we thought a majority of people, there will always be exception to the rule. If somebody already trains like this very, very consistently, and this is their programming, like if you open it up and you're like, oh, oh my God, this is identical, exactly, <clears throat> identical to what I do. Well, then, you know, you're you're going to get less benefit. But what we did was we knew that what how what's being put out there in magazines, what most people are following from bodybuilding.com or what the latest, mm-hmm. greatest Instagram star is saying, we're saying, listen, 
Here's a collection of things that big rocks that we know a lot of people are missing. And here's how you organize those big rocks to get the most bang for your buck. And so we knew that a majority of people are going to greatly benefit from programming this way. Mm-hmm. So that's really the the science behind it that makes it so well, special in comparison to other programs. And there's a reason why we have so many MAPS programs. <laughs> Again, there's so much your body can benefit from training in different ways. And, um, you know, our goal is to keep bringing di- more and more variety and, and, and be able to elicit different adaptations so that at the end of the day, you can kind of take your body where you want. And it's a, it's a lifelong thing. And if you're working out for 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years, <coughs> which would be amazing, um, you know, you're going to go through cycles of training. You should go through cycles of training different ways. Otherwise, you're going to hurt yourself or you're going to get bored and you're going to stop. Yeah. Did I get that right, Doug? Is it three days left in, for the start? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Final Excellent. three days at mindpumpmedia.com. Mind Excellent. Bring on the bird. Where is the bird? Green Claw. The ankle has landed. Chimera Claw. Today's Claw is being brought to you by Chimera Coffee. It's the only coffee that is infused with all natural nootropics for a cleaner, calmer, and more focused buzz without the crash. Click the Chimera link at mindpumpmedia.com and input the discount code MINDPUMP at checkout for 10% off. It's the motherfucking quad. The eagle has landed. Our first question is from Tao F. Stefan. How do I improve my squat? Hmm. Huh, that's not a loaded question yeah. <laughs> at all. Well, it depends on what is preventing your squat Ooh, from the old. It depends. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole because if I do, then you're not going to get a straight answer. And it depends is like uh, piss people off because yeah. they kind of want to hear like a general like, what can I do? Well, I want to start with you know driving this person to the Mind Pump TV on YouTube. So we literally, and I, I know I mentioned this on the forum. I didn't mention this on the podcast. So uh, part of why I wanted to do this was so I could mention this on the show. So we have almost, I think, 300 videos now on Mind Pump TV. And it would take somebody a long time to probably sit down and go through it. So what Doug has done is actually created playlists. So when you go on the home screen of the U- Mind Pump TV, there's actually a tab at the top that says playlist. If you hit playlist, then you could scroll down and he's organized all the videos on topics. And there happens to be a, I think, a 10 part series of videos that are all about three or five minutes long. So, you know, literally a good 45 minutes to an hour's worth of information regarding the squat. And it's how to squat like a pro. And we break down all types of different movements to help prime the body and get it ready. Now, the reason why we we picked those movements, it's not to say that there's not other things to help you squat, were these were a lot of areas that we know that people suffer from like imbalances or poor connectivity, poor pathways. And so they it was a collection of movements that we all agreed would really help improve someone's squat. So it's not to be said, or it's not to say that, they're uh, the perfect exercises or moves for you, but a majority of people tend to break down in a few areas, mm-hmm. in, in my opinion, right? So I, I in my years of training, I've seen uh, people are limited by their ankle mobility, they're limited by their hip mobility, and their thoracic mobility. Those tend to be the three main areas that I see people break down. Now, there's, of course a plethora of all kinds of other things that could be going on with somebody's squat. But in, in, in my experience, those are the three areas that I see the most. You mm-hmm. guys? Yeah. yeah, I would 100% if agree. you have to base it to three, yeah. I would 100% agree. Um, so, of course, number one, we're always going to say work on mobility and correct uh, muscle imbalances. Unfortunately, because we're on a podcast, uh, I can't be we can't be specific because what one person's thoracic – issues may look like may require different movements than what someone else's thoracic explain that too i mean the fact that we uh, i think we i want to simplify this as much as we possibly can so by thoracic mobility i mean what happens to people is when they get down in a squat typically it's an over rounding yes they they round and they collapse forward and that's because 90 percent of your day is spent in that position Mm -hmm. we're doing things we're driving in front of us we're writing on paper in front of us we're talking with our hands in front of us so it rounds the body forward. So, of course, naturally, when you do a movement that's challenging, like a squat, mm-hmm. especially if it's loaded, 
and you get down really deep, yeah. the the areas where you are you have the least connection, like in the area, the thoracic area, like we're talking about the ability to take those shoulders and keep those shoulders peeled back when you get down in that squat. They tend to collapse and roll mm-hmm. forward, mm-hmm. which is is setting you up for potential injury or just not even feeling the movement correctly. Then it starts to bother your knees mm-hmm. or your neck or your shoulders, and you're not feeling it where you should. Yeah. So I mean, number one, kind of perfect the squat, perfect how it feels. You should feel comfortable in it. You should feel tight. You should feel stable. If you have access to uh, videos, you can watch our videos, and you'll kind of see what videos, uh, what squats should. Kind of generally, yeah. Well, like. that's the first real issue is to, to understand, you know, what yours specifically looks like. So, a lot of times, this will even take like I, I suggest like going to a, a personal trainer, somebody that's like has a very good assessing eye that can articulate mm-hmm. like what specifically is going on with you. <clears throat> and so, this is something that we've actually done with, with people coming into the forum and then they want to actually like get some feedback. Uh, because a lot of times, you know, you don't really see, like, you understand the concepts, but, like, when you go to apply them, you're still having the same issues, and you don't really see yourself from a critical eye uh, as somebody looking outside in. So. Yeah, and, you know, here's something that kind of blew my mind a little bit. We were talking to uh, Dr. Jo- Jordan Shallow um, uh, the other day. We had an interview with him, and he was saying how terrible of a cue it was to tell people to sit back mm-hmm. with their squats, yeah, which is was- something... Everybody says. Yeah, no, that was some great, and some the, great when, knowledge bomb. He and when he explained this. it, it made a lot of sense because if, you, if you're telling someone to sit back, what they're probably going to do is they're going to anteriorly tilt their pelvis in a very strong way, which means they're going to shorten and contract their hip flexors and shorten their erector spinae muscles of the lower back. And you'll see this when they're squatting because they'll their toes will want to come off the floor. They'll, they'll feel like they're they're falling back, and sometimes they'll feel hip impingement. Mm-hmm. So uh, what, what he said for those people is don't try to sit back. Bend your knees first. Embrace your core. It's funny because my girlfriend actually sometimes has this issue. I change the cues. Boom, it fixed her squat yeah, right away. Learning to break at the knee. So you know now you go there, and, I, and then I have to challenge this. We just had someone who did a, a post of their squat on the forum, and I thought it looked really good, but you know, what I noticed was he was kind of sitting back the same way too, and he wasn't breaking at the knees at the same time. Now, typically people that do that, I find they don't have a lot of ankle mobility. Mm-hmm. They Their knees don't have a lot of room to travel. And mm-hmm. I think there's some general rules too that hopefully I can help some people out with. One, one is that uh, the taller you are, this tends to be a, a more common issue, right? So when I get really tall people, either women that are above Five eight five nine men that are above six foot when they squat, they don't have a lot of travel uh, with their knees going over their toes, and so they end up having to sit back, and then it arches their low back. So, you know, l- working on the ankle mobility is going to help you get down in in good depth and allow you to break at the knees and the hips at the same time. Because if you break at the knees and the hips at the same time. What ends up happening if you don't have good ankle mobility, then you end up like stopping at a certain. And then you just do like a good morning squat, right? Type of deal. Exactly. Lots and of then, bend over. You know who squats like that? Lane. Yes. Lane mm-hmm. Norton squats a lot like that. Mm-hmm. Um, he's got a lot of forward bend in his squat, um, which is why when we interviewed him, he said how at, uh, wearing a weight belt adds so much to his squat because he's so, you know, low back. Uh, his low back plays such a big role. You know, in it, a squat. And since mm-hmm. you since you called him out on that, I I feel it's like just should, the way he squats. No, I think I should yeah. share this because Lane initially was somebody who helped me improve my squat. He did a squat video a long time ago, and I know Jordan kind of ripped into him about some of his stuff. But it, there was some good takeaways that I got from his squat that allowed me to progress my squat. But what I found was. I was modifying my squat instead of r- addressing the mobility issues that I had. So you were you were just getting good at compensating. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So Lane helped me get a better squat, but what he really did was he kind of helped me cheat my my imbalances that I already had and I didn't realize that later until I had someone like Justin Brink mm. break down my, my mobility, my connection to my feet right. and my ankle mobility and then it really opened my eyes up that hey, I can squat ass yeah. to grass if I put the work into all these areas that I need to address. Now my squat looks fucking completely different. I'm talking about and a it year. feels better. Well, so speaking of Dr. Brink too, so like in, in maps prime like 
this is this is why we we have a we have a stick we have a dowel bar that we use um to assess like our contact points when we go down into the squat so you can kind of see where uh the breaking points are and you know for me like to get that nodule on the back and kind of keep my my head from going forward so that's something i have to constantly consider and think about a lot because i i tend to want to you know come forward with my with my head and get that forward head and that's bad on my cervical spine and so i'm trying to work on that part of it now i'm also connecting between my shoulder blades with with the stick i'm connecting down here uh you know in the tailbone and just having those uh that 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 constant feedback so i have mm-hmm. that feedback of just touch uh, I can really self-assess. So that, that's what, one thing, you know, because I mentioned, you know, other people on the forum kind of uh, critically looking at this. But like if you if you want to just get going with this and, and, and figure out whether or not you're you're in a good angle or, you know, if your shoulders are, in fact, you know, protracting as you're coming down, uh, you know, the all these things like you can actually take a stick and just do that and keep your arms back. And we have that, you know, highlighted. Uh, in think, the program. So I so I'll, I want to add one thing though. With uh, here's some good takeaways with uh, for improving your squat. So let's just let's just say you've got good form, you don't have any major imbalances, you've got a decent squat. Now, how do you improve your squat? Well, one of the most effective things you could do, and Repet- first off, repetition. Yeah, and first thing you want to do is you want to look at the people who master uh, strength in the squat. And so you look at power lifters and you look at Olympic lifters and believe it or not, Olympic lifters are some of the best squatters in the world, uh, alongside power lifters. In fact, I would argue in some cases, Olympic lifters are better squatters, but if you watch, uh, their training, what you're going to find is they squat frequently. They squat a lot. Olympic yeah. lifters in particular squat almost every single day and the high, high, high level ones will squat several times a day well think of it like this i gave this analogy one time it's like the working out to me is like the game of golf and driving is like squatting and i'll be the first to admit that for the first 10 years of my career i fucking was playing putt putt golf that's i got really good at putting the ball around all the time because i didn't want anything to do with the squat because i was terrible at it but you're never going to fucking win the masters not learning how to drive a ball off the fucking tee. You've got at one point, if you're going to be great at this sport, going to be great at lifting, you've got to get that squat down. And all the details in the swing on a golf club is real similar to a squat. There are so many little parts that affect the entire movement, and you are most certainly not going to do it one time. And, oh, look, and that, wish, let me back up. Some people will. They're gonna and those just like in golf. There's that guy or girl mm-hmm. who grabbed a club, swung it one time. Their mechanics were gorgeous, and they became fucking. That's s- rare. It's rare, right? Mm-hmm. But it happens. Same thing goes for those. Some like Ben Pack said it. The first time he ever sat down in a squat, he squatted 400 pounds. Yeah, I spent 30 years of my. Sense to their you're body. right. I spent yeah. 30 years of my life getting to a 400 pound deep squat. You know yeah. what I'm saying? He did it the first time he tried it. So there are some people mechanically that are just. They're built and they're right into that group. What most of us, though, are going to spend countless hours at the driving range. You spend lots of money on, you know, teachers and like yes. different like it golf is, clubs. It is and that complicated that of a movement, but it is also that awesome of a movement. But there's also just the frequency factor, like you know, squat frequently. Like if you even if you do a body part split and you're training your legs once a week, yeah. uh, that's fine. Throw in some squats uh, every third day, also. And watch what happens to your squat weight. Quick commercial break, you guys. We keep getting asked all the time, how can I support the Mind Pump family? Here's one of the best ways you guys can. You guys love that Chimera Coffee that we have. Chimera Coffee with a K. You go to ChimeraCoffee.com. Put in the discount code Mind Pump for 10% at the checkout. Also, if you guys want to know how I have this luxurious beard and you want one too, go to BigTopBeardCompany.com. Put in the discount Mind Pump again, but this time for 33% off. Also, you guys, if you guys have not tried Ben Greenfield's new bars out, they're fantastic. If you want some, go to BenGreenfieldFitness.com forward slash Nature Bite. Put in the code Mind Pump and get 10% off. Go check it out. T Myers 100. What is your opinion on carb cycling for fat loss? So carb cycling is referring to the the technique where you go low carbs some days, mm-hmm. and I'm really generalizing it because there's lots of different ways to carb cycle. 
where you go really low carbohydrate some days, and then some days you have uh, higher carbohydrate intake. Now, yeah, typically, I, I typically like consider this more f- like performance wise as far as like you know carb loading up you know before an event or something like that. Dude, too. it's also yeah. it's also bodybuilding wise and yeah, uh, you know, oh, it's my go to and building muscle and burning body fat wise. Like, there's there's and, and it, okay, real quick before we get into this carb cycling, carb cycling is not a top three priority. Okay, calories macros, quality of food. And now if you've got that all down, then you can start playing with carb cycling. So I want to be clear with that because it's not like if you're eating shitty food and then you're you're playing with carb cycling, you're not going to get any benefit from it. So, but with carb cycling, uh, typically when you go low carb, typically what people will do is they'll bump up fat. So those tend to be inversely related in the diet. Now the benefit of carb cycling is that it improves, or at least studies suggest that it improves insulin sensitivity, meaning if you take in, you know, if you're always taking in 500 grams of carbohydrates every day or 300 grams of carbohydrates every day, your body actually starts to become a little less efficient at utilizing those carbohydrates. Your, your, your body starts to need more insulin to use, take those carbohydrates and to shuttle them into, uh, into the tissues that it needs it. Carb cycling improves insulin sensitivity so that you get more bang for your buck, uh, if you will, with carbohydrates. When we interviewed a while back, we interviewed uh, I think the world or the American record holder at the 100 mile, you know, race or whatever, extreme endurance athlete Zach Bitter. He went ketogenic for a while, and then he would introduce carbohydrates right before a race and during a race when mm-hmm. he would power up. So that's kind of a form of carb cycling. And he says that he notices that his body utilizes those carbohydrates so effectively because he's made himself so carb sensitive, whereas mm-hmm. before. He would eat a shit ton of carbs all the time and not get near the benefit. Now it's just pure high octane. It is. Dr. Mercola even recommends a version of this. And for those of you who don't know who Dr. Mercola is, he tends to be very controversial, but he's like this ketogenic diet What, what did he call the champion? The cyclical? The cyclical? Cyclical ketogenic diet. Yeah. Mm. So he is like this super keto guy, has been advocating for it for a long, long time. And he even, in his new book, Fat for Fuel, he even says to include carbohydrates at least once or twice a week to promote metabolic flexibility. Um, and there's some health benefits to it. I personally, probably amongst the three of us, am the least likely to have high carbohydrates of between all of us. But I have carbs. Uh, I'll eat at least 150 grams of carbs once or twice a week because I notice performance benefits. I notice uh, health benefits from it as well. So I definitely think I and mean, just taking it to a step further, I think you should cycle everything. For, yeah. Not just carbohydrates. I think you should cycle anything. But that's kind of question how was I just about, about yeah. if if you've never done it, I'm a huge fan of of incorporating it. Uh, I'm really excited to do it again coming up real soon here. So I have plans to do this now. Carb cycling was my staple go to uh, you know way of dieting. If I were to categorize, how, how did you do it before? To get ready for a show. Yeah, like how did, no, how did you do your carb cycling? Well, what okay. was your routine? Well, now, how I carb cycled, I manipulated a lot based on different shows. Oh, okay. So, But w- what I'll do is I'll give you kind of a, a generalization of how I utilized carb cycling. So I was a heavy carb eater going into competing. So and we've, I've talked about this on the show before that um, I was eating anywhere between 400 to 600 grams of carbs every day. So that was my... I was a lower fat, higher carb, uh, moderate protein eater uh, to maintain a 220 pound, you know, body. And I, when I started to compete, I used carb cycling uh, for my cutting down for a show, and it worked fantastic. And so what I would, and in different shows, I did different things. So for example, I would run like a, a high day followed by a moderate day, then a really low day. So I'd have a 600 grams of carbs, then I'd have a, you know, 350 grams of carbs, and then I'd have like a 150 grams of carbs. Now, did you <clears throat> increase fats or change proteins along with it? Uh, a little bit, but not okay. a lot. Uh, I so lo- the low carb days were also low calorie. Exactly. Okay. And so I, I want to point that out, that a lot of times a, a, a good portion of the fat loss piece is coming from the caloric restriction for one or two days out of the the cycle, right? Because if you are using it for fat loss, but then you increase your fats so much 
that it, the calories don't really change very much, well, then you're not really going into caloric deficit, so you're not going to see much of a, a fat loss that way because you're just replacing the calories that you took mm-hmm. back from carbohydrates. This is actually a mistake that I see a lot of people because a lot of carb cycling programs recommend that as you go low, lower carbohydrate that you increase your fats, which you you should somewhat, but not to the point that it equals out the same amount of calories because at the end of the day, that matters more. Like you mm-hmm. brought up the point like, It's not the big carb cycling is not the biggest rock here. Like your macros and your calories are bigger rocks. So if you eat the same amount of calories and you just cycle the carbohydrates, you're not going to see this huge change in your Mm -hmm. fat loss. So that's one way. But then I ran other days where I would run three, four low days in a row. And then I would do a large read feed where I do 600 plus grams of carbohydrates. But then I do like two or three days of 150 to 200 grams. The point of this is that you can do a lot of different ways. You don't have mm-hmm. to follow a specific protocol. Mm-hmm. The idea is restricting your body from yeah. what the amount of carbs it's used to, whether you cut it in 50% or 75%, restrict that for a couple of days and then refueling it back. Yeah. I don't know if it's common or not, but I just know that like with this specific question, a lot of people have uh, this, this sort of thought process with carb cycling as being like you're – you got a normal amount of carbs and then you're going to over uh, introduce mm-hmm. carbohydrates like as, as like an event, like uh, just from a sports kind of perspective. Like I know like a lot of athletes have this misconception where they don't restrict going in uh, leading up into the event to, to be more sensitive to the carbs that you're introducing. They just load. Into. Yeah, they just load a shit ton of yeah. carbohydrates for that day. Yeah. Then, so carb loading is a form of carb cycling. It's not really for fat loss. It's more for performance. But even carb loading, you're you're an experiment with this because everybody's a little different. So I don't want an athlete to do this like right when into a competition, never tried it before. But a little carb restriction before a load right. will give you a better benefit. Bodybuilders have known this for a long time. Yeah. Now they don't they don't do it for performance. They do it because they know they hit the stage and they look muscles look big and full. Because well, once the- I figured that out, I just know it's like. Uh- even myself had that sort of misconception going into, uh, the, you know, because of what the coaches say commonly. Um, and I, and I feel like if athletes like would at least try that and obviously not like right away in, in, in like massive restriction with it or anything, but like at least start to experiment with that, you're going to get a lot better benefit. From I, I love to do like small versions of this within a normal week. Like, let's say you're not even a carb cycling person, but I know, and I kind of did this when we were in Tampa. Like, I know that I'm flying on a plane. I may not get a workout. So I'm like, these, if there's not a, this is a time when I don't need a lot of carbohydrates. So I'm going to go, I'm going to lean more towards the ketogenic type of eating. I'm going to go heavy fat. I'm going to go that way for two or three days in a row. Then I know when I get back, I'm going to have a great, awesome workout. So the day before I'm going to, I'm going to start to load up on all the carbohydrates. So I went just yesterday. I had a, I haven't had this in probably eight months. Yesterday was my first, you know, 400 grams of carbs in over a year. I can't wait to work out today. Now, what did you eat for the for, for your cars, by the way? Well, they weren't all good. So, oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I share this stuff on my my. You uh, post everything, anyway. Yeah, so yeah. I I do share. I, I had a, a huge thing of popcorn at the movies, and then I also had two Five Guys burgers. And you know, I'm glad you asked this because this is actually a good good topic that I was going to address on my Insta story. Is I I do have a really hard time. Like, so I had 4,700 calories. It's really tough for me, and I burned 4,300 because that yesterday. Mm-hmm. So I have a really hard time eating in a surplus consistently, day in day out, with actually not incorporating f- high calorie, high carbohydrate type foods like that. Or without incorporate. I may, this may even be a more accurate way of saying it. It's hard without including some kind of highly palatable food. Yes. Right. Yes. Right. Because like I when, didn't even want, like I ate right before I went to the movies, right. but I was telling Katrina we're going to be sitting for two hours. I'm only at this many yeah. calories like this. I'm like, let's get a popcorn. And I didn't the, even want the popcorn. And there's to something to learn from that. Like highly palatable foods. These are foods that are engineered to just hit all your taste buds and just for you to love them. If you're trying to eat a lot of calories, uh, it, you can get like it's it's easy to get sick and full of you know chicken and rice and yeah. vegetables and you know, sweet potatoes and all the healthy stuff. It's like, I just don't want to eat anymore because I'm kind of full. But if you throw like a highly palatable food at someone, like a Five Guys burger or a bucket of popcorn, they might be more well, likely to eat and it. So I'm glad you're- but that's not an excuse for people obviously to go- It's know. not, but I do want to share this because <laughs> I just do- gave people I though. do keep shit real on on this show and on my Instagram. And I, and I, I preface this whole bulking phase for me with, you know- 
what I'm doing right now is not ideal and healthy for my body. I'll be the first to admit that. My body wants to be in this 205 range. I'm trying to push it to a 225, 230 pound male right now. And I get all the signs that it doesn't want to be this way. But I'm showing people that process and what that looks sure. like. To, one, and one of the signs is you just don't want to eat anymore. Yeah, I don't exactly. I've li- I, I lived that way for a I, long time. I didn't even eat the whole popcorn because I didn't want any more of it. But I knew, like, I was like, I need to add these calories. I need to get them somewhere. And I barely still was in a surplus from what I burned that day. And on top of that, coming home later that night and having two Five Guys burgers. As great as it all sounds, it's funny how how hard it is to live on, on, on outside of either. Like your body has this area. Where either end of the spectrum. Yes. Yeah. Pain in the ass. It, it, either end is, is a pain in the ass. Dieting really, really hard to get really, really lean, like abnormally lean, is really challenging. So is bulking for a guy who's or girl who has a hard time getting up to certain weights and so i'm sharing that process and these are some of the strategies that i have to use to consistently Mm -hmm. get up there so well i'll tell you this the human body thrives on on variety but consistent uh variety and what i mean by that is i don't mean consistent variety like you're just changing everything all the time I mean, you change some stuff and you stick with it for a little while. Then you change something else and you stick with it for a little while. So just like with training, if I go and work out and I know that my body thrives on variety, I may think that I'm going to go and just do, just go do wild, wildly different things every single day. That actually isn't as beneficial as sticking with a particular plan for two or three or four weeks before switching over. Because you want to give your body time to adapt to that new yeah. stimulus. The same thing is true with nutrition. Mm-hmm. It's just the time frame is a little different. So what I mean by that is uh, you don't, you may not necessarily want to eat radically different varieties of food all the time because you may actually get an upset stomach. Your, your microbiome adjusts to your food a little bit. Like if I'm super keto all the time and I'm like, I'm just going to throw in you know 600, calorie, 600 grams of carbs, it'll probably fuck my stomach up. And vice versa. If I'm a high carb, low fat person, and I'm like, you know what? Tomorrow I'm going to cut all carbs out, and I'm going to eat 150 grams of fat. Like, you may have some stomach problems. In fact, I've had people tell me that when they go keto, and they'll eat, you know, 100 grams of fat, and they're like, I'm constipated. I can't. And, you know, you you want to have variety, but you want to be a little consistent with your with how long that variety is. And when it comes to nutrition, carb cycling is one of those things, and so is protein cycling, and so is fat cycling, and so is calorie cycling. I'll tell you what right now, if you're trying to burn body fat, there's two ways you can approach it. One way is to have a calorie deficit every single day. The other way is to have bigger deficits on some days, smaller deficits on other days, and on other days, maybe maintenance or even a small surplus. At the end of the week, it all breaks down to the same numbers, but because you're having that variety, your body tends to do better that way. Same thing with proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. In fact, even uh, bodybuilders are catching on. You know, we interviewed uh, Ben Pakulski, who was uh, like one of the most well-known professional bodybuilders uh, in the IFBB, a massive, massive human being who, and he's got this gym with personal trainers, training clients, and most of the people in there want to build lots of muscle. Obviously, they're going to an IFBB pro gym, and he recommends most of the people that go in there have a low protein day once a week. Yeah, fasting, protein fasting yeah. once have a week. Once a week. Once a week. He has Be- all his trainers teaching his clients. That's, that's very right. forward thinking. Fucking awesome. And it's yeah. not just for health, although your health will benefit from it. It's because he's noticed that people build more muscle when they throw a little bit of variety in there. And so carb cycling is up there, but it's not just carbs. Like I'm telling you, try this with fats, try this with proteins, uh, try this with different vegetables and different kinds of meats. And there's, there's times when I eat lots of fish and other times when I eat lots of red meats. And you'll not only will you see that your body responds and reacts and changes better, more consistently, and feels better, but you're also going to learn your body a little bit better. Well, I, I want to echo what you said about too being consistent about doing whatever that is, though, for a little while and tracking and paying attention. Yeah, you got to know what's changing because what's some people hear that I think, and and I and I get worried because I think, oh, they, they you know they say undulating your calories, so high day, low day. Well, then I don't really need to pay attention because I know sometimes I eat a lot and sometimes I don't. 
So then people aren't connecting the dots right. if you're not doing that. So I do, the, again, highly recommend the tracking and paying attention to that. Like the going back to the original question of, you know, carb cycling. It's mm -hmm. like, hey, you know, run some really low carbohydrate days in a row for you. But first, you got to know what your baseline is. Like if you don't know what your what's what's carb cycling to you, if you don't even know what your average carbs right. are every single day. So for me, that's step one is figure out what what do you consistently eat for carbs? Okay, let's say you're a you know, 250 gram carb eater a day. Well, then if you're going to cycle, you're going to do something between, you know, 75 to 100, 150, and maybe 300. Those are going to be like the cycle ranges, but that would totally change for someone the same size, same you that are same body type as you, same goals. If they are eating totally different, mm -hmm. because you're talking about a guy now who eats 200 grams of carbs or less on a normal day that used to be a four to 600. Yeah. So my carb cycling that I would do change. would change. It changes. And I'm such a feel guy, right? I always talk about intuitive eating and nutrition and exercise and all that stuff. When I cycle foods and I cycle, cycle macronutrients, the way I do it is I don't track um, like, like Adam would, for example, I don't write things down and add things up. I will cut carbs until I feel like I need them. That's how I cycle. Or I'll cut protein until I feel like I need more or I'll drop my fat until I feel like I need more or I'll bump my calories or drop my calories until I feel like I need more. Exp now, explain a little bit about, because you know, I know there's a lot of people that hate me and love you and what, would want to follow how you do things. So explain what... you got to really... First <laughs> off, you got to really understand how your body responds to different things. So it may be different for you. But for me, I will drop carbs and I'll do it until I notice that my muscles look a little stringy. Uh, I feel a little depleted in my, my lifts. I don't get as good of a pump. Um, and I, I start to kind of look, feel a little bit gaunt. And then I'll bump the carbs up and I'll get that water. Now, in. would you say, uh, because I, I go off of this feel too. Now, would you say there's sometimes too, like things that like when you push it too far, like headaches or fatigue or things like that, that you start to notice if you go beyond like what you probably should have? Well? I, I noticed that my strength starts to drop more than anything, <clears throat> mainly because I feel so, I, I otherwise will feel really good with low carbs and high fat. Um, so, and then on the flip, if I eat a high carbs, I'll notice that if I stay on that too long, um, I start to hold too much more water. I'll get a little more stiff in my joints, sometimes a little brain fogs and I'll drop them down. And I just kind of play with that. I see what my body needs. I know what the, my signs are that tell me what I need. And then I, I work with it accordingly. So my nutrition doesn't look the same from week in to week out uh, either. The health engineer. Since the release of the MAPS programs, what has been the most negatively positive criticism you have received feedback on? Based on that, would you change anything about the program? Is that, so, an, is that an oxymoron? Yeah, what do they mean? Like <laughs> positive? <laughs> like, the, like the most is it negative? negative versus positive? Yeah, like or what are the, I think just mean, what are the criticisms? Yeah, like? I think what, what are the I think what are the criticisms? What, what have people said to us about the program? And uh, you know, I wanted to talk about this because, uh, to be honest, mm. we and we we do like uh, there's we have a 30 day money back guarantee. So we've had people at at one point ask for their money back. But if I'm sure and Doug probably knows this answer better than anybody. Uh, one, it's extremely rare uh, Two, majority of the time that he ever tells us about it. It's normally that somebody like, it's like a new listener that hasn't like heard any of well, the, or the Yeah. They, or, op they yeah. open it up. Right. So here's the, the, the most popular one that I've ever heard him say, right? Like they open it up and they see that it has movements like squatting, deadlifting, overhead pressing. And there's, n there's not something that like, like wows them. It's not, a, there's no side presses. There's not a and, bunch uh, of movements or exercises jacks. they've never seen before. It's not like it's this, unless they do like perform maps green or whatever. Well, it's yeah. Usually with the red. Yeah. yeah with, yeah. with with red or black that we use a lot of staple movements in there that we all agree are some of the best things you can do which I think we're not the first ones to talk about that. I don't yeah. think I don't think we're the first ones to say that a squat is the king of all movements, a deadlift is probably the second of all yeah, movements. It's going to show up. Yeah. Uh, so I think that uh, we do get some people that that are they buy programs and this is kind of their mo they they buy they hop from one program to the next program and they're just always looking for something that is totally different than the last thing that they were doing and so they open it up and they say like oh my god there's squats and deadlifts and overhead press here I've seen these movements before yeah I don't I don't want this program I I um, think probably that the the two thing the first criticism that we'll get is if people open the program and realize that it's not a body part split. And we actually get people like that. And again, it's typically people who listen to one or two episodes 
don't know how we tend to program. Right. And by the way, the way we program these workouts is based on what the majority of people would do best well. It's not going to work for every single person, but a majority of people it will. And uh, so it, High it's, majority. So it, 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 it's usually full body type routines with more frequency. It's not a body part split. So sometimes we'll get people who will open it up and be like, oh, you know, I, I'm, this is not a body part split. I don't like it. So they won't even try it. And the second comp complaint I've gotten before, especially with MAPS aesthetic, is that their workouts are like an hour and a half long, the, at least the foundational workouts, the, the three days a week that are the harder workouts. And this is because you're doing the whole body and you're doing a lot of volume. Now, the days in between are much shorter, but if you're, you know, want to be in and out in 45 minutes, some of our programs take longer than that. Hmm. Not all of them. MAPS Anabolic, you can get in and out in 45 minutes for the most part. Those are the two, I guess, biggest criticisms that I get. Yeah, I think maybe in two, like even with performance, I think there's been some criticism with like volume, uh, with concern to, with these like new movements that we kind of introduce people towards. And so I think it's just the, most of it's coming from a place of like, I'm uncomfortable. I'm not good at this. And, you know, this, <laughs> some people like own it and then, you know, and that turns into like, oh my God, that sucks so bad. I loved it or whatever. Uh, but yeah, sometimes people like if they're unfamiliar with moving their body in that direction, even like it, it, it may feel like an eternity. I that, can, I can think, think of one thing I would change. Well, uh, oh really? I was, yeah. Yeah. I could totally, what I would change is when we first introduced the programs and posted them on our site would be to address what mm. the, like what we knew the common things you may, oh, be, well, yeah. may be going through. These are, we didn't do that yeah. enough. This right. is stuff that we, this is coming down the pipes. I mean, this is something yep. that we were going to be addressing, but I, as far as the actual programming, I, I don't think any, there's I, all out of every complaint that we've ever gotten in three years. Uh, there's nothing that would make us change the program. In fact, we thought when we created the programs, we thought about all the objections. We thought about all the things that who's not going to like this. Why wouldn't they like it? What people could or couldn't yeah. do it. So there's nothing within the program. I think the probably the the biggest challenge we had early on, like when Red first came out, and maybe we just had Red and Green was was knowing that there were other other things that we wanted to address, like Prime. Like Prime to me really yeah. Yeah. Com- once we had all three of the foundation programs in, and then Prime and, and then soon to be Prime Pro are released, I feel like we are really- we filled a lot of holes. Yeah, we're really addressing uh, a majority of uh, almost everybody training there. The only thing I feel like maybe we lack um, somebody like very specific things, right? Like I, I, I hope one day we get to go back and revisit Green and address like sp- sport specific like a oh, soccer yeah. player oh, yeah. a basketball yeah. player a football player you know this is exactly what they should do with maps green to for their sport or going and saying mm-hmm. if you are training for a power lifting meet mm-hmm. these this is how yeah. you should program leading that so we we have i know i know i know some specific criticisms we've gotten uh i can now they're starting to come to me like in MAPS uh, performance, like the first phase, which is really a strength power type phase, like we're trying to build as much strength, strength as possible, mm-hmm. we'll tell people to, raise, to rest between sets like three minutes. Oh, yeah. And people will complain like, no. I don't want to rest three minutes. That's too long. It's revolt. And they don't understand the, pr- the, the, the reason for that. There's specific type of programming, and you're not in there to try and fatigue yourself. You're in there to try to maximize every set and to be able to generate yeah. as much, if not more force, you know, as you do each – you know, successive set. So I, I think a lot of the criticisms come from confusion mm-hmm. more than yeah, anything. Yeah, I think, and that goes back to what you said, which is what we're going to be working on, which I'm so excited for what we're going to be doing as far as more really co- breaking it yeah. down, more, more coaching. Of the reasoning and yes. coaching, more yeah. coaching, coaching. Too. Did I just say that? <laughs> more coaching, <laughs> <laughs> more coaching Adam, to you're the affecting me. Right, I know. Yeah. Uh, more coaching to the point. Hopefully, it goes the other way for me then, man. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> more coaching to these points that mm. uh, it's. And let's be honest, it was one of the hardest things I've ever done in my entire career, at least, was trying to create something for the masses. Uh, It was very, very difficult, especially that we are all super anti-generic anything or anti-one way for everybody. So how do you create specific programs that tens of thousands of people are going to be following? Like, talk about a fucking challenge, you know? Yeah. So, I mean... Well, I, l- luckily what's you been... You got to leave a bunch of open doors. Well, luckily what we... what Our dream was to give people the framework of programming, depending on the 
which program you do, ma- you know, MAPS Anabolic or Performance or Aesthetic or whatever, and give them sample workouts as to how we would program these workouts for most people. But our dream really was that people would do these, get good at them, and then start to learn their body and mm-hmm. modify them. And now that we've been on air for, you know, two and a half years and, and we've been having, you know, people have been doing the programs for over a year or so, we're seeing a lot of that. Like, well, we're seeing people who are, are taking the concepts, modifying it, and learning their bodies and creating their own type of workouts, which I fucking love. 100%. I mean, that to me, yep. it's like uh, it's like going to college for business school. Like, we're not going to tell you what business you have to do after you go. It's like we're trying to, help, we're trying to give you some of the uh, – lay the framework or set the foundation for the things that you need to know before you go start a business, right, or go train, train yourself. Like, here are some foundational things, but – We've since day one encouraged, you know, flexibility within the program. Like this is, we give you framework, and then from there, it's like, you know, we encourage people to modify and change. And that was really that's what makes the forum so awesome too, is people getting on the forum and sharing this stuff. And then we have open dialogue of why that's a good idea or why that's probably not a good idea. Because mm. sometimes people put out stuff out there like, hey, I, I thought about taking this phase and doing this instead. And we go, well, actually, yeah. that's not a good idea because the purpose of that is this, and that's kind of counterproductive to what you're trying to do. And we explain that, and then it makes sense, and then people learn from that. Or some people go like. Hey, I'm thinking about doing this for this phase instead of that, and we go brilliant idea, yeah, yeah, excellent. Idea. If it works great for you, do that. You know. So, quick commercial break. Hey, people ask us all the time how they can support Mind Pump. Here's what you can do: uh, you can go to www.brain.fm forward slash Mind Pump and get 20% off Brain FM for meditation or focus. You can also go to audibletrial.com forward slash Mind Pump and get a 30 day trial plus one free audio book. Lastly, you can go to getnatureblend.com forward slash mind pump and you will get a discount on Ben Greenfield's CBD product. Next question is from K Rock. Your thoughts on the Netflix documentary, What the Health? Oh, wow. It's a piece of shit. More like, what the hell? <laughs> Thanks for we, listening. Who, to who the hell let's, made me watch that piece of shit? Let's, let's start off by saying that uh, we did watch this t- in full because... We had so many people on our forum, so many people on Instagram reach out to all of us wanting to know our <sighs> opinion. And I want to say to everybody that it was very difficult to watch. And we all we all right away after about the first five minutes saw the direction it was yeah. going and we're ready. To, and we all agreed that, listen, as painful as this is and as much as we know it's bullshit, we have to listen to all of it so we can speak to any points that people have questions so about. So if you haven't seen the documentary, what the hell? Well, first off, you need to understand something about- You don't need to waste about, your time. Well, here's what you need. <laughs> yeah, no, watch it. I recommend people watch yeah, it. Yeah. I recommend you watch it with an open mind. Uh, there are some nuggets of truth in it, um, which I'm going to cover. But uh, watch it and because it's important to see all points of view. Because somewhere amongst all this information is is where you're going to find your the truth. Okay. Yeah. Well, it just screamed uh, bias, like immediately. Uh, well, that's what I was going to say. And propaganda, and you know all the above. So if you didn't see that in the first five minutes, like make sure and watch well, it so you can kind of check yourself. That's the on thing. That. That's the thing you have to understand with documentaries. Anybody can make a documentary. Yeah. It's and, not. Yeah. It's not like here's here's my issue. Okay. So this is all coming back again to like the whole flat earthers and all these kinds of things where uh, uh, these ideas get sensationalized and uh, people think that in, in a certain format, like whether it's like, you know, highly produced and it's, it's a documentary uh, it since, it, since it's a doctor documentary feel, that means that uh, you know, this is, this is counter information, which means that it's, you know, this is true. So here's, so here's what you need to understand. First off, anybody can make a documentary and anybody can have a bias and make it sound a certain way. And all, if you want evidence of that, look at documentaries that support liberal policies in politics and look at documentaries that support conservative policies in politics. Both of them are going to make super compelling arguments. They're both super biased. They both go in with a particular goal in mind and the goal is to sway the voter. This documentary, 100%, I will bet anything on it, on it, uh, on this statement, was 100% driven to get people to stop eating all animal products. I would uh, venture to say, and I don't know this for sure, but like I said, I'll bet money on it, that the producers and the director and whatever of this 
particular documentary are vegans and have very, very strong moral opposition to eating animals and animal products. And I've talked to vegans who have very strong moral opposition and they will really make strong cases against all animal products. That's what this documentary does. This documentary talks about how literally all animal products are bad for you. It even goes and talks about how ba- how fish is bad for you. How, uh, you know, omega-3s from fish are crap and you can get them from flax and, you know, how, oh, uh, how corn and wheat are so good for you and we're designed to eat those things. And so it went so extreme. It said eating meat is racist. It, it, you know what's funny? What in the fuck? It actually, it, and this is like, I it, have to call it out. Dude. It actually fucking tried to like, make the you, connection. Oh, rrr, excuse it actually, me. It actually tried yeah. to make the connection that eating pork products and pork was racist because these pork farms, you know, are creating, uh, you know, pollution, and it's always in these poor minority neighborhoods, and they're really strongly trying to make you fucking not want to eat any meat whatsoever. And, and what was the, the other one that I just fell off the fucking couch when they showed, uh, what was it? Was it fish? Was fish was like eating cigarettes? Yeah. They showed like a plate of fish and then like a yeah. plate of like 20 cigarettes. Like it was like eating. Oh my God. And all the old <laughs> graphics they used in like 1982 to, to describe how bad cholesterol is for you. You know what I mean? It's just like all this like repurposed. I like, mean, these, uh, I, I wouldn't these be surprised. It was painful these to watch. These are some of the things though. I think, I think what is important to talk about this is like, okay, why did why were were we so quick to know that it was bullshit? Like these are the key indicators that yeah. I, I pay attention to. Is like when when you when you have to take extreme analogies to make a point like that. Like you're 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 trying to prey on people's emotions, right? I, I even believe they used a nine eleven comparison. Yeah, didn't they draw? Didn't they mm-hmm. draw in on nine eleven? It was 100%. very. This was a very political documentary. It was yeah. very like if I was watching PETA put together a documentary and they're trying to scare the shit out of everybody enough mm-hmm. to not... Here's my advice to, to, to people who are moral vegans. First off, number one, I respect you. You have a moral opposition to eating animal products. That's awesome. I support you 100%. And I even sometimes can relate to you a little bit. There are times when I actually can understand that. That being said, you will never fucking win the argument if you try and say all meat and all animal products are bad and that's why people shouldn't eat them. And it's bad for the environment and it's killing the earth and it's racist and all this horrible shit. Not only will that not work, it's going to make people eat more meat. So stop being idiots. (laughs) If you want people to stop eating meat... Use the moral argument. I promise you'll have more success. And then you can say you can eat a healthy vegan diet also. Okay? So that being said, here's the bottom line. Humans are omnivores. Fact. There is no debate on this. We are omnivores. We have teeth for this purpose. Humans evolved eating a wide variety of foods that were available to us. We learned to harness fire very early in our civilization, and that is one of the main reasons why we ate meat as much as we did. Meat is very calorie-dense. It's extremely, in some respects, nutrient-dense. In fact, there's certain nutrients that are rare or impossible to get from plants. Now, if you're a vegan in modern times, congratulations. You have so much variety available to you that you can combine foods and get real you know, specific with certain things. But if you were in nature and you, you ate no you fucking meat you imagine, ever. Could you imagine being a, ve- a vegan like uh, a thousand years ago? You'd die. Yeah, you'd die. <laughs> 100% you'd die. You, you would die from, you would have nutrient deficiencies. Horrible, horrible nutrient deficiencies. So it's, we're omnivores. So stop trying to make that, that, that case. Meat uh, from good sources, eggs, fish, uh, animal dairy even which is where people. we agreed with the the documentary on some level like they're talking about processed meats like they're probably not that great for no, you all, yeah. pro, all no all all heavily processed foods are not good for you like hot dogs salami heavily processed bacons like probably not good for you um, but they were citing in, in this particular documentary they cite studies they cite a lot of studies so they try and make this real compelling argument but you got to look deeper at the studies for example they com- they they showed that there was a, a strong association between dairy and diabetes. But if you look deeper, you'll find that it's non-fat dairy that has association and not the full fat variety. Right. Um, meat, uh, they say, increases your cancer risk. Well, first off, if they don't control for processed meat, we have a problem. Processed meat is not good for you. It would be like me saying, you mm. know, uh, fried broccoli chips uh, you know, are bad for you, therefore broccoli is bad for you. No, it's the processing of the broccoli chips or whatever that would make it bad for you. Mm. So that's that's something to be considered. Also, people who eat tons of meat all the time 
today in America, you'll find two people that do this, bodybuilders and people who tend to be unhealthy. And the reason why people who eat tons of meat tend to be unhealthy isn't because the meat is unhealthy. It's because people who watch their diet nowadays have been bombarded with so much information that they tend to restrict meat because we've been told that it, you know red meat and stuff is bad for so long. So you've got this kind of self-selection bias. Lastly, there may be some truth to a super high protein diet increasing cancer risk. And this risk has been made or this correlation or, or this uh, connection has been made in a few studies. It's not solid. The, salt, the, the, the studies aren't conclusive. And the increase of risk of cancer with high, high protein is rather small and it's with certain types of cancers. And it doesn't always work because it actually has a reverse effect on people when they're older. So my point is, uh, I wouldn't use those studies. Uh, I wouldn't even refer to those studies and say, don't eat meat or whatever. Totally, this documentary 100% felt like PETA put together a documentary to scare people to stop eating animal products. I mean, first it goes into red meat and I'm like, we're all shaking our head like, okay, well, this is wrong, but we'll keep watching. Then it gets into eggs and I'm like, okay, now this is really fucking hilarious. Then it makes the case against fish. And then I'm like, nobody says fish is bad. <laughs> nobody says fish is bad. Yeah. Like this is this is getting crazy. Yeah, it's and it control. just kept going and going and going. And I, I'd say that this this documentary uh, gets a one. Yeah, on a and Netflix put it on their platform. Thanks. It's yeah. a, it's really unfortunate. And you, I wish you could find like details on like how the fun where the where the money is going, and we could just. I, I yeah, think it would be that should have been left on YouTube, right? I yeah, can't, for all the weird. I can't believe that it made made it to Netflix, yeah, man. I, like I was pissed off at Netflix for that. Here's one. here's what's gonna happen. It's, you gotta know they got paid. It's uh, Fuck yeah, they got paid. It's uh, polarizing, so it's gonna get a lot of views, right? It so it's demonizing. It mm. demonizes all animal products. So that's going to get views. It's also the right climate for it because we've heard for so long uh, low fat, high carb is healthier. Then we kind of heard from the fitness industry that like paleo and keto and pro, you know eggs are good for you now and you know eat red meat if it's good from good sources. And so people have been hearing that now. So yeah, this we made documentary, a lot of progress. So this documentary <laughs> sounds counter so it's like this controversy right you know i, I also i want to say though that i mean i've trained lots of clients that are vegan so i i'm okay with somebody that wants to eat that way if you really enjoy eating that way you feel better that way i just like to help people i like to help connect the dots for my clients on why that probably is and if you want to continue eating that way then to each their own i think that's totally okay what i don't like oh is is documentaries like this and then see i told you that this is the yeah. way to eat i told you that this is look at all now the we have to unpack this and explain right. this stupid thing like you know it, 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 I don't know. I guess I just get disappointed that, you know, the information we present, you know, over the last couple of years and all that, like you, like it, it's tough because now, okay, now this is something new again that we have to like, no, 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 this Dude. is just another attempt to persuade, you know, sway your attention in another direction that's going to lead you nowhere. First off, when it comes to longevity with diet, context is very important. Okay. If you study the ancient, uh, the diets of the, uh, the ancient Inuit, uh, you know, cultures, you'll find long periods of time where they won't eat a single vegetable or fruit at all. In fact, it's quite rare. They live in very, very cold climates, and for long periods of time, all they eat is animal uh, meat and fat. That's it. Like That's all they live on. And when you study these people, which they have been studied, they have excellent health. And does that mean that you should eat a diet like that? No. It just shows that the human body is quite adaptable and we're omnivores and, and, and you can you can be healthy eating a lot of different ways. Now, the best science that we have says this, don't overeat. That's number one. I don't care what your macros or whatever. If you overeat consistently, it's probably not good for you. Don't overeat. Stay away from overly processed foods. Yes, most studies will show that. And uh, you probably want a lot of vegetables. You maybe want some fruit and you want some uh, animal products, some kind of you know well sourced meats, eggs, fish, and in some cases dairy. The overconsumption of anything is bad. That's what the science shows. This documentary, 
uh, super, super polarizing. Well, we talked, wrong. we talked right away. I mean, the first thing that comes to mind when I see something too, it makes me chuckle because it actually grabs the attention of so many people. And I think we should make a funny documentary that yeah. we could, yeah. I mean, I, we, I threw out there that we could do a documentary on what, how water is toxic and could kill you. Yeah. You know, if we interview the right people, cut and splice certain bits of information and yeah, we'll science, scare the shit out of you, right? It yeah. Just there's you could take a and then sway you with you like, could just take whatever a information. spin on almost anything to show how it reminds me of political documentaries. I mean, I love watching political documentaries because both sides of the political spectrum. Yeah, it's just like a Michael Moore. They, or one oh of those guys, my god, they make know? me so. Speaking of Michael Moore, I loved it when he showed how Cuba gives free health care and he's going to go to Cuba to get his free health care because they're so fucking awesome. And I'm like, you know, last time, last time I called, mm. I don't remember any Americans like dying on rafts, homemade rafts trying to get to Cuba. It's the other way around. But anyway, uh, it's on both sides of the spectrum. I love watching them because they always crack me up because yeah. it's always, first of all, every political leader is Hitler depending on which side <laughs> you're on. Know. It really charges people yeah. up, man. And nutrition and religion and politics, it's all the same shit. They yeah. all, so yeah, what the health, uh yeah, totally trying to make the case. You to gave it a one, vegan. I give it a point five. Yeah, garbage. What the hell? Garbage. Fuck off. Hey, uh, go to Mind Pump TV on YouTube. We've talked about improving your squat. We talk about carb cycling. Actually, we did a video on uh calorie cycling on there. There's a new video every single day. It's a hu- it's a it's a amazing free resource. Tons and tons of information. So if you can't get enough fitness information in your life, go to YouTube. Subscribe to Mind Pump TV. You'll get alerted every time we drop a brand new video, which is every single day. Also, if you want us to ask uh, answer a question that you have, um, the place to do it is on Instagram. So you go on Instagram, go to Mind Pump Media. That's the page. Ask us a question underneath our Q&A meme. And if we like your question, we'll read it uh, on air and answer it on air. We also have our own personal pages on Instagram where we cover different things. My personal page is Mind Pump Sal. Adam is Mind Pump Adam. Justin is Mind Pump Justin. Oh, and by the way, Doug has a page too. It's Mind Pump Doug. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now, plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.